turn those notifications off. Okay, how's everybody doing today? I hope you're all having a good Sunday. We'll get started here in a couple minutes. <laughs> nice, Joshua. Where are you headed? Let's get a little elevator music while we're waiting here. everybody a couple more minutes to show up.
Eric just asked if there's going to be a Beaker app for phones someday. Um, we don't have anything planned right now, but mobile is obviously something that has to happen for this ecosystem to get moving. So it's not on our roadmap yet. Um, we're also making sure that we're putting out enough code for anybody that wants to make their own mobile browser that uses DAT. And um, there's a project that's trying to do that right now called Bunsen. So hopefully they'll make some good headway. So we have a, um, a guest on the uh, live stream today. Hello, good cat. So uh, if you have a good board, just, you know, watch the good cat and you'll have something to do. Uh, let's see, Ryan just asked, is there any way to use Web, Webpack dev server in dat sites and Beaker? I haven't um, tried to do it. Um, <laughs> I haven't tried to do it, so I don't know. Um, yeah, I'd, have to, I'd have to take a look. Um, lately I've been using um, a command called tempdat, which is pretty handy if I want to have a, a live streaming and uh, sort of temporary uh, dat, so tempdat, right? So if you go to npm.im slash tempdat, that's the name of the, the module. This is exactly how it works. You just do temp, you uh, install it, and then you run tempdat um, in the command line. It'll create this dat, give you the address, and you can um, work on that dat. It'll stay updated so that whatever is in your folder will be immediately put into the uh, dat URL. Um, and then once you close the process, it throws away the dat forever. Uh, so that's really handy if you just want to have a quick throwaway dat and done write me files or anything like that. It's all in memory. Um, so that's what I use right now if I'm doing some um, work and I want a dev server equivalent. That's what I use. All right. I think that's probably enough time. Let's get started here. So um, I have brought some whiteboards today. It's like a slideshow, but uh, physical. So let's get into this. All right. Uh, the Beaker browser uses the DAT peer-to-peer -peer network, right? Uh, and we use this as a sort of drop-in replacement for HTTP. So you can serve sites directly from your browser, and your browsers talk to other people's browsers. So whenever they visit a site that I've made, their browser is going to connect directly to mine. This is pretty handy because it makes it really easy to do self-publishing. Where if I make a website, people can connect directly to my laptop and get the site that I've made. One of the mechanics of the DAT protocol is that it works a little bit like BitTorrent in that everybody is sort of equal on the network uh, and can help share a website. So if I make a website, and Bob gets the website from me, then Bob can actually help keep the website online so that Alice can get the website from Bob. Uh, everybody can basically contribute bandwidth to keep a site online. This is really handy, especially because if I ever go offline, Bob can still be online and keep the site um, you know, findable for me, right? So he can help keep the hosting going. Now that's pretty good, except sometimes you don't have a Bob to keep the site online for you. Uh, maybe you just haven't talked to anybody or your site's not popular yet and you need to be sure that your site stays online. For that, we have created a tool called Homebase. And so that's what I'm going to be demonstrating today. The idea with Homebase is it's a server that's acting like a peer. And you can set up this server and it'll stay online reliably. Uh, and it also does a couple of other handy things like to help you uh, deal with um, an HTTP version of the site and uh, uh, even uh, get your TLS certificate automatically with Let's Encrypt. So that once I set up a home-based server, again, I can go away, 
but I can rely on my server staying online and doing the hosting for me. Okay? So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Hopefully this will be relatively straightforward to uh, understand. Uh, it requires a little bit of uh, uh, knowing how to use the command line, and um, so if you're not familiar with the command line, you'll need to go and read up a little bit on that. Um, but that's pretty much all you need to be able to do. So let's let's get started here. The uh, software for Homebase is located here, Beaker Browser slash Homebase on GitHub. Uh, and I have a link in the chat if you're looking for it. Uh, so we're going to start um, from the uh, DNS all the way through to getting my site online. I have a site already, and we're just going to be putting at a new address. That site that I have is pfrazy.hashbase.io. All right, so this site is already being hosted somewhere else, but I want to get it hosted at paulfrazy.com. So to do that, I'm going to use uh, Homebase. Uh, and I'm going to go to the peer-to-peer -peer version of my site and find the original key. Okay, there it is. So here's the raw dat URL. And I'm going to tell my home base server to host this URL that I have highlighted right up here. And to do so at datpaulfrazy.com as well as at httpspaulfrazy.com. So then, let's get started. Actually, why don't we start with my DNS. paulfrazy.com is the address that I want to get set up. And I have a server running that um, is actually a Google uh, Cloud server. It's already set up. Its IP address is right here, and so I went ahead and created these A records pointing to the address of my web server. So let's go ahead and SSH into my web server. Okay, and I'm going to change my user real quick to keep raising. All right, step one, we need to install Homebase. So I'm going to run npm install-g, meaning install globally, at beaker slash homebase. This should be pretty quick. While it's running, I'm going to just take a look and make sure there's nothing in the chat I need to take a look at it. Eric asked, if your computer goes to sleep, will it still accept incoming connections and serve the site that you're seeding? Uh, the answer is no. If your computer has fallen asleep, it's not being a seed anymore, and you're going to need something like Homebase. Okay, so we got Homebase installed. That's step one. Step two is we need to create a config file where we tell Homebase what to host. So to do that, I'm going to use Emacs. You can use any other editor you want. And I'm going to edit this file right here. If I can type, here we go. Okay, it's in my home directory, .homebase.yml. Okay, you see that? So I'm going to open .homebase.yml in my editor. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just enter which dats I'd like to have served. So I enter in this dats colon, right? And this is the part of the config that's for dats. I do a dash because I'm about to do a list of dats that I want. I only want one dat. And let me check my notes. So first I'm going to give it the dat URL. And that's this one right here, the raw URL with that long key in it. I'm going to take that and I'm going to put it in for the URL field. Okay? That's telling Homebase which dat that I want hosted. On another line, I'm going to tell the address that I'd like this hosted at. So I'll do domain colon and then the address, which is paulfrazy.com. Okay, so now my home base will know exactly which site to show at which location. That's good. There's one other thing that I need to do, and that is set up Let's Encrypt. Thankfully, this is really easy. I just need to tell home base what my email is and that I'm okay with the terms of service on Let's Encrypt. So inside the same config file, I type in Let's Encrypt. Just another field there. And then I type email colon and my own email. And then I'm going to type in agree TOS. I agree to the terms of service of Let's Encrypt. 
And now we're done. This is everything that needs to get set up for my uh, home base instance. With that done, all I need to do is run the home base command and cross my fingers and we should be ready. Now, sometimes it goes kind of slowly. I haven't figured out why it does this. So live demos are just gonna be a live demo. That's anticlimactic. I'm gonna try reinstalling it again. Not sure why it's doing that. Hmm. Usually you want your program to start whenever you run it, but uh, I guess Homebase doesn't want to get started. I don't have any data cache that might be tri uh, tricking it or choking it. Huh. Boy, that's not fun. All right, I guess we're going to do a little debugging. That's going to keep the live stream exciting. So I'm going to go ahead and clone the repository and work from the source and see if we can't get this fixed. So I cloned the repository from Git. Now I'm doing an npm install. I'll bet good money that as soon as I run it off the uh, source code, it'll work. Actually, I, <laughs> I hope that that's what happens, because <laughs> then I'm going to have to start digging around in the source code. All right, what's my start command here? Index.js. So I'm just going to run the index.js. And of course, it starts exactly like you want. And it's interesting. Okay, well, a little homework for me. At any rate, this is what you should see whenever you run the home base command. You get this output telling you exactly how you've configured home base. It tells you where the data is. That's going to be in the dot home base folder in my home. It's showing which ports it's using. And it is showing which features are currently enabled. Let's encrypt is enabled. Nothing else is. It also shows exactly which dats are being served. And this is the dat that I input. And that's my address. So. If we're lucky, I should now be able to go to datpaulfrazy.com and see this website right there. Let's see what happens. There we go. Okay, step one is accomplished. We have a site uh, up at a nice short URL. And on top of that, if my computer were to turn off, I would be confident that it stays online because the um, because home base is running. So that's a nice step one. Step two, what would be really nice is if people could also go to the HTTP version of this site so that if they don't have Beaker installed, they could still go to HTTPS, paulfrazy.com and see the site uh, just like if they were in Beaker. So, to do that, we should use the HTTP mirror feature of Homebase. And this is also very easy to do. We're going to open up the config file. And there's just one more option we have to add, and that is we go down to the bottom, and we do HTTP mirror true. We save it. I'm going to try running the installed version again. Nope. All right, gonna run it from source then. Oh, now source is doing it. That would.
figure, wouldn't it? I'm just going to debug this the same way I would even if I weren't on the live stream. First thing I'm going to do is try to find out where it's getting held up. And it's cliche, but the way that I tend to debug stuff like this is I just stick some console.logs in and see when I stop getting those outputs. Given how sort of inconsistent it's being, I have a feeling that it's just going to run. Okay, no. So one got output, but two did not. Let's take a look inside of emacs index.js. I didn't intend to do a live debugging session for the stream, but now that's what we're doing. Okay, we've got a couple of standard library requires occurring here. We've got a require of libconfig and a require of server. I'm going to double check what my requires are doing. I don't imagine that uh, either the OS or the path requires could possibly be causing this thing to stall out. I don't think that any of the node built-in libraries would cause something like that. My hunch is that I have some kind of logic inside of libconfig that could possibly block the thread. So let's take a look. Here we are, it's a libconfig. This is kind of a big file. We got a lot of includes. Okay, so if we look right here, this default config directory, we've got some calls that I might consider as being a possible source of this problem. So I'm going to stick out a few more logs and see if this um, reveals anything. Again, I'm just waiting for the time that I run this again and it just flies through, it doesn't have any stalling. Scrolling through this code to see if there's anything else that gets run when the script is run as opposed to just declared. I would bet you that that's the only bit that gets executed when the required call is made. Yep, okay. So just for clarity, I'm also going to open up the index.js and do logs around each of these requires All right, now if we're lucky, it'll stall out again so that we get even more debugging information. If we're unlucky, so to speak, it'll all work as expected. Yeah, there it goes. <laughs> okay, well, I'll just keep those console.logs in there, and then the next time it happens, I'll be able to figure out a little bit more information. But we're back to what we were originally trying to do. Home base is running as expected. And now we have, if you look, if you remember what I was doing originally was turning on the HTTP mirror. And now Homebase is telling us that that is enabled. Great. That means that I should now be able to go to HTTPS, paulfrazy.com, and see the exact same website. And there it is. Okay. So now we have Homebase running a nice uh, short name version of my site. It's keeping it online in the peer-to-peer -peer network, and it's giving us an HTTPS mirror. Pretty handy stuff. Um, now... I guess at this point, <laughs> uh, I can uh, definitely check the stream to answer any questions, but there's one other interesting thing to share about Homebase, and that is that it has a web API. Now, we haven't done any UI for this yet, but we have put out some libraries so that it would be easy to make your own interface to it. And in fact, I think somebody may have done this recently. Homebase is something that you could run you know, up in the cloud, which is what I'm doing with Google Cloud, but you could also run it at home, like somebody suggesting with the Raspberry Pi. And that's pretty handy if you wanted to have a little computer running in your you know, office or in your uh, house somewhere in the corner. You could just get Homebase running on it, and then um, what would be really nice is if you wanted to use that web API, you could ask it to add and remove um, uh, DATs for you. Uh, and maybe give yourself a nice web interface instead of having to edit the config file. So to do that, you first have to make one more change to the config file. And that is, you add the web API config. I'm going to actually have to jump over to the readme to reference this. Let's see. There it is. Okay. 
And you're going to set three things. You're going to set which domain it should run at, and you can run it on top of an existing domain. So I'm going to run it on top of paulforazy.com. And then you set a username and password for this web API so that only you're able to access it. So I'm going to do username admin and password admin. So that's really good security right there. Save it, and then I restart it. And now let's find out if it's going to run for us. Of course, it runs for us. Now the web API is also enabled. So if you want to leverage this, you can go to the, uh, let's see, I think, no, that's not the one I want. This is the specification for that pinning service API. So I should be able to do something like, let's see if I can go to like get account. Then I need to be able to do one. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Yeah, I didn't prep this part. But you should be able to use these, uh, let's, let me find the library you can use, the debt pinning API library. There it is. So from here, once you've been turned on the web API, you can use the debt pinning service client and then you can use this kind of nice interface for logging in and getting account information and listing which debts you have uh, added and then adding debts and things like that. So that's something if you're looking for a little more adventure out of what you can do with Hashbase, you should be able to use the pinning service to do that. Okay, so that's pretty much all I had prepped for today. So now you know how to keep your debts online. It's all self-deployable. Uh, and I guess for the rest of the uh, time, uh, this was pretty quick. For the rest of the time, we can get into um, questions and answers, and maybe I'll keep on trying to debug this home base bug, figure out what might be causing this. First, let me check and see if there are any questions. Let's see. So Pro Bono asked, what if my website needs a database? That's a pretty good question to get into here in a moment. Joshua is also asking, how different is the home base code base from the hash base code base? Yeah, so I'll start there. What's the difference between home base and hash base? Um, home base, let me change up this. So uh, home base is basically the same software as hash base in terms of what it does. They're both um, what you might call pinning service. We're still kind of figuring out what the right thing is to call this, but it's, um, it's like a DAT pure service. It keeps stats online for you. Uh, the difference between home base and hash base is that um, one of them is easy for a single person to set up, and that's home base. Uh, and the other one is designed for lots of people to use and all have their own accounts. Uh, and it takes a little bit more to maintain, a little more to set up, and that's hash base. Uh, both hash base and home base are self deployable. Um, the code's all out there, and ha hash base should be relatively easy to deploy. Um, but home base is the one that we're spending time on trying to make sure that if you just have a VPS or you know a Raspberry Pi at home and you want to get something going, uh, that's what home base is for. We're just trying to make sure that uh, we have good versions of software for, for basically everybody to be able to self-deploy. So that's the difference between those two. Uh, question is, if my site runs on WordPress, can I mirror or proxy it on Beaker? Uh, that depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, if your site is able to be, uh, so, so basically the, the DAT network is a files network. So anything that you are putting into a DAT website, it has to be in the form of files. Now if your WordPress site is able to spit out everything that it um, hosts as a set of files, then yeah, you can then go to the folder where all those files are and create a data of it, and there you go. Um, but if you have WordPress dynamically generating pages, um, which is it's likely that it does, it's not going to mirror so well. So you're better off probably using something like Jekyll, um, which is like a static site generator. Um, to produce a set of files and then you do a dat mirroring of that. You can also watch the last live stream I did to 
um, see what it's like to build a site with absolutely no site generator and instead use things like web components, um, which is what I'm into right now and I think that's pretty cool, um, but it's still kind of a new way of doing things. Uh, let's see, Eric asks, are people hosting conference videos on Beaker sites yet or downloading them from YouTube and hosting them peer to peer? Uh, the P2P, P2P web uh, conferences Terra, maybe you could grab the URL for that, but that that's the uh, first one that I know that has been mainly peer-to-peer. -peer. Let's see if I can find it. I think actually I have it on my hash base. Let's see, hash base. I'm sure I can find this in a moment here. Yep. So this is my re-hosting of it. Oh no, I want the PP version. So these are a series of conferences that were run actually in a sort of distributed fashion. Uh, Lewis Center was involved in it, John Kyle was involved. Uh, lots of folks that I'm probably forgetting now. And uh, all of the videos of this um, have been... Okay, Tara can't post links in the chat, good to know. Uh, so yeah, here is the uh, conference site, and if you go to this, you can find all the videos uh, from the different conferences. So there's one, there are a couple in Berlin, a couple in Los Angeles, a couple in New York City, and they have all the videos um, posted up here. So yeah. You can definitely do video hosting on uh, DAT if you want. And we're still working on the tooling around the live streaming, and eventually I'll start doing my live streams over, over DAT and peer-to-peer, -peer. but I personally just want to wait until we have um, more of the tooling finished up. Okay, Kai asks, what about AMP or PWAs? Um, we don't, you can't access the DAT API out of uh, Service Worker yet, so you're not gonna have as good of a time with the PWA. Uh, it's not impossible. I think it'll be great whenever you can access the, the data APIs off of service workers and stuff. You just can't do that yet. So that's where we are now with that. Uh, definitely nothing with AMP. AMP doesn't really jive with our tool set. And I think we are now getting into some. All right, I'm just gonna keep debugging this require bug while we chat. If I'm gonna write a static site, would I recommend React or Chew or a web component? Good question. Um, those are all really good. Uh, the advantage of React is that that ecosystem is amazing. Uh, JSX is really um, great to, to work with. Um, the patterns are really well defined. Uh, so, for most people, my immediate response is, yeah, use React. Of course, with React, you're going to need a build step. Um, so, if you're not interested in a build step or you want something that feels uh, a little less heavy, Chu.js is really great. Uh, Chu.js uses tools so that you can get something that feels like React, but without the build step necessarily. You can optionally do a build step, but it uses the new uh, template strings feature to generate HTML DOM uh, elements uh, directly from uh, strings. So it actually parses them in real time or at runtime. Uh, and, you know, um, those are both great. They're both very frameworky, of course. What I'm trying to do lately is get away from frameworks entirely and do purely vanilla. So that means um, no libraries, no frameworks, and no build steps. And again, if you watch the live stream that I did last week, you can see that it uh, requires, um, well, I, I'm, that's where I'm using web components. And uh, I'm kind of, I'm falling in love with it a lot uh, the actual templating is not as good because I'm not able to just write HTML. I have to do things like um, use query selectors or doc document.createElement and things like that. But the uh, web components are really neat because of how they encapsulate everything that they do. Um, you're able to add functions to the DOM elements, which is really fun. If you're using the shadow DOM, you get style encapsulation, which is also really great. So I'm 
really enjoying that. Um, but it's also kind of um, hard to recommend it unless you're interested in doing a, a dive into some kind of green territory, right? Because the web component world is, is still pretty fresh. Uh, he asks, how can I get that knowledge or, or skill set? Um, search around. Google has published a bunch of tutorials uh, about um, using the Shadow DOM, about web components, uh, things like that. And uh, you'll just have to um, play with it. Again, like I said, check out my live stream from last week. I show a little bit about how that works, what it's like. Um, whenever, let's see, there it goes. That's interesting. I'm stuck on required to getting some good information about fixing this bug. So, um, you know, the reason that I've been going vanilla is in large part because I'm trying to understand the ecosystem that we can build within the DAT and Beaker world. Uh, and so with when you're using DAT, you can actually sh uh, publish code modules on DAT sites. Um, in fact, I have a lot of code published at uh, pauls-uikit.hashbase.io and I import all these functions using the ES modules. So that ends up looking, um, you know, like, uh, let me show you what that looks like here. So I'll be working on a website and I'll, I have a sugar for a query selector that's a dollar sign, right? So kind of like jQuery. Very simple function. I can show what it looks like. But so this is how I would start writing a function. And then I would say, you know, let's say I'm trying to get um, a nav link. I can now use that function, right? So basically, I've been publishing JavaScript modules and then being able to import and export them using these ES modules. And it's all just on the DAT network which is pretty cool. I mean, this is a, uh, every DAT archive is uh, signed using a cryptographic key, uh, and I can actually pin versions so that I know for sure which one I'm using. So that would be, I'd put a plus sign and type the version number, and let's say version uh, 300. Um, and we're working more on those version pinning tools. We're talking about getting some content hash um, uh, versions so that you have a strong reference and know exactly which version you're getting. Um, but it's a really neat way to, to write things. And so whenever you're writing a web component, you end up writing something like this. Um, let's say my nav element. And then if I want to use this, I just export the class. And now I've just created a, a, basically, if I put this on a DAT site somewhere, I've basically published it. And other people can import my nav element and use it in their own applications. I'm not streaming my screen. Yep, okay, that would be helpful, wouldn't it? <laughs> Great. Forgot about that. All right, here we go. So here's the import command I was talking about, right? Uh, and then... Uh, so you can import modules, uh, import code from modules that you publish on DAT sites. You can see right here that I've just got this personal website where I publish all of my code. Let me take the version off of it so it's a little more clear. And then, uh, so I'm importing this dollar sign function, which is a really simple sugar for query selector. It actually is written like this. Right, really simple little sugar, um, but I use it all the time, right? Because nobody wants to have to write uh, query selector all the time. So uh, I published it at this data address, and now I import it into all my different projects. And I've, there you go, right? It's almost like I've got npm baked directly into the web. Uh, same story with these modules. Anytime I write a web component, um, I can export it, and then I can. Um, whenever I use it in the website, I'm basically publishing the web component along with the entire website. So I have another, let's say that this is at, let's say this is part of paulparisi.com. And 
in some other app, I could now say, all right, I really want to reuse that nav element. Now I can. I just imported it off of the uh, site that used it originally. So it's kind of like the web that's, the dat web is able to basically function as you originally wanted, you know, NPM to be. Um, and that's especially feasible when we improve the versioning tools so that you can say specifically, you know, version one of the site, that's the version that I wanted to have. All right, let's see. Yeah, the uh, content hash versioning will be pretty helpful. I think the term we're going to use for them is strong links. Um, and it'll make it so that if the underlying key ever changed, it would uh, not be, uh, it would fail, right? So you don't get somebody subtly switching out the code underneath you. It'd be very useful. Uh, Sim, I guess is how I say your name. You said uh, that I like my like might like lit HTML from Polymer. I definitely would like lit HTML from Polymer, but I'm trying not to use frameworks or libraries. Um, I'm hoping that lit HTML. I'm pretty sure that's the sort of the DOM diffing tools. I'm really hoping that we'll end up getting into the native web platform so that we can all just you know um, not have to use frameworks anymore. Um, yeah. All right, I'll keep on uh, answering questions, but I'm going to go ahead and keep debugging this. So require two is where it got held up, which is interesting. Require two, I think, was yeah, right before lib server. So lib server was the one causing the bug. All right, who in here could be causing this problem? Mm -hmm. Gonna have to do the same thing I do every time, just start sticking some console dialogs in there. Hmm. It's almost like doing a bisect algorithm or a binary tree. You just sprinkle in some console.logs broadly through the thing, and then you find out where it stopped, and then you bisect your way down. working fine, so we're not getting any interesting information. I guess I'll just try and keep running it. Actually, I want to mute the data directory and see if that triggers it. Nope. Kind of gets stalled right before ASDF3. ASDF 3-2, ASDF it just slightly sticks right before that. I'm not sure that that's the one that's stalling whenever it's a total stall out, but that's a good bet that if there's a pause, that there's some kind of something happening. And that's the vhosts includes. Maybe that's just slow. That may not tell us enough. If I can't trigger the bug, then there's not a lot I can do. 
See, now even the normal command works. Some kind of information that just isn't coming up fast and blocks the whole thread. I'll have to keep debugging that, so hopefully if any of y'all try to use home base, you won't run into that. If you do, let me know. And I guess that pretty much wraps it up. So hopefully everybody learned about home base and you basically understand what it's for. Um, I'll keep going for about five more minutes in case you have any questions about home base or how to use it uh, or about anything else. But other than that, that pretty much wraps up the live stream. So thanks everybody for showing up and uh, we'll do this again soon. Let me get some music on here. Tara demands for me to show you the cat, but I don't see the cat anymore. Calling the world from isolation. Cause right now that's the bowl where we betray. And if you're coming back to find me, you better have a good aim. That's right, Eric. If you, um, if you don't want to bother with self-hosting, that's what we've got a hash space for. The basic idea we have is, you know, uh, here's the thing that's convenient, and uh, if you want to do the independent thing, you always have that available. You can always jump off of our stuff, go to the thing that self deploys but if you don't want to self-deploy yet, you can use the service that we have on. Asks, have we experimented with home base on serverless platforms? Would this be possible? I have not experimented with that yet. I encourage anybody that's interested in that to try it out. It really just kind of depend on whether or not the DAT protocol handles their whatever firewall configuration the platform has. I don't see any reason why it shouldn't work, but we haven't given it a shot. You might have to rewrite some of the software to make it compatible with their platform. Uh, your dad said I can call serverless functions and everything. Yeah, I mean, it should be, should be possible, um, but I just haven't tried it yet. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm looking for something that could possibly be causing the entire process to stall out during startup. I'm not sure what it is yet, but that seems like it could be doing it. In a way, what we're trying to get done, talking about the serverless thing, we're sort of trying to do something very serverless with all of the P2P web. That is to make it so that uh, you don't need to have a server at all, like truly serverless, and have your application be deployable just by um, publishing the data address and then it just runs on people's computers. And then if you have a server component, I would actually love to get it so that users deploy the service element of things rather than the developer. Um, so that there's just no DevOps anymore for, for somebody who makes an application and everybody's able to self-deploy whatever application they use. Yeah, of course not. Fine. So no more information there. But I have instrumented the heck out of this thing, so next time I'll be able to figure it out. It's a good suggestion, Joshua, except that it has stalled since the web API was enabled. So I don't think that's what caused it or had any bearing on it. What's happened? All right, well, I think I'm going to wrap it up with this, but I'm going to keep debugging this thing. And like I said, try to get this bug out of here. But uh, I don't know, just keep the live stream interesting, right? Have the software break right when I'm demo demoing it. Y'all have a good Sunday, and we'll do this again next week. Catch y'all later.